Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 2F, where we're going to talk about mutations that affect function even though they're not in coding sequences. So we'll talk about regulatory sequences in DNA that are recognized by proteins, about sequences in RNA that affect splicing and translation, and about regulatory RNAs. Now, there are a lot of different non-coding sequences that do affect phenotype. They're only a small effect component of the genome, but they're vitally important. And you've already learned about almost all of these. So the first class I want to remind you of is sequences that affect transcription. So sequences can affect when the DNA is transcribed, what cell types the gene is transcribed in, and how strongly the DNA is transcribed. For instance, the sequence of the promoter determines how, once transcription has been activated, how strongly RNA polymerase is going to bind there and initiate transcription. Mutations that affect a promoter will change that. Um, there are many regulatory sequences, um, mostly in front of genes, and changes to any of these can affect when or the cell types or how strongly the gene is transcribed. Um, sequences in the DNA can also affect things that happen to the RNA. For instance, the ribosome binding site in the messenger RNA affects how strongly and efficiently the RNA is translated. And intron sequences affect splicing. We talked in a previous lecture about the fact that Almost all the sequences in introns are effectively junk. As far as we know, they have no contribution to phenotype. But introns do contain some critically important sequences because the sequences at the ends of the introns provide signals to the splicing machinery telling it what sequences should be cut out. And you'll see an example of these mutations, I think, when we talk about cystic fibrosis in um, Module 3. Now, other genes function as RNAs in the same way that most genes get translated into functional proteins. And by far the most important of these are the transfer RNAs and the ribosomal RNAs. We already looked at transfer RNAs um, in the previous lecture. Um, here's an example where we'll think briefly about mutations in the RNA itself. We talked about how a mutation in the codon can change the um, meaning of the sequence. But now we want to think about mutations in the transfer RNA itself. So for instance, a mutation that changes the transfer RNA shape can change whether or not the enzyme that normally adds the amino acid onto the transfer RNA will act. They can either mean that the transfer RNA doesn't get charged with any amino acid at all, it basically goes into the ribosome, but it can't do its job, or it may get charged with the wrong amino acid. Even more dramatic are the effects of mutations that act that change the actual anticodon. So mutations at any of these three positions here in the transfer RNA will change which codon the transfer RNA binds to. For example, a mutation that changed that G into a U, a mutation in the DNA that changed that G into a T, would result in an aspartate transfer RNA charged with the amino acid aspartate, but with a codon that does not recognize the aspartate codon in messenger RNA. Instead, it would bind at a different codon and insert aspartate at a place where there should be a different amino acid. Now, I'm not going to talk in detail about mutations in ribosomal RNA, but I did want to show you this model illustrating the structure of the ribosome. It's easy to think of molecular machines as being mostly made of protein, but the ribosome is mainly an RNA machine. Proteins are synthesized by an RNA machine. Here's you can't even see, it's just this intense tangle of RNA, but almost every base in that RNA has been optimized by natural selection so that the machinery 
folds into exactly the right structure to carry out protein synthesis. Most of the proteins that are components of the RNA are just there to help the RNA fold into the right structure. All the critical work is done by the RNA. And of course, ribosomal RNAs are highly conserved RNAs because so much of their sequence is critical to their function in protein synthesis. Now, another category of non-coding sequences that are very important for function are other molecules that function as RNAs. Um, some RNAs are themselves catalytic, like the ribosome, but much smaller. This is an example of a very much simpler RNA folded into a structure called a hammerhead structure. It's a catalytic RNA, and it's held together by base pairing. For example, these bases pair with each other to create the secondary structure that gives it its catalytic function. Another category of functional RNA, again, that can be changed by mutation, are what are called antisense RNAs. Um, you'll encounter one of these um, in Module 3. These are RNAs whose function is to prevent the expression of genes, not by preventing transcription, but by preventing translation. And they do that by being complementary to part of the messenger RNA. So this antisense RNA can form base pairs with this messenger, messenger RNA and prevent it from being translated. So here's a question, sort of a summary question. When can a mutation that's not in a coding sequence change a phenotype? And note that these are square boxes, meaning you can choose more than one answer if more than one is correct. Well, all the answers were correct. All of these are ways that mutations can change a phenotype even though they're not in a coding sequence. Now, what we've done, we've talked about the important functions that non-coding sequences can have. All of these functions can be changed and destroyed by mutations. So regulatory sequences, recognition sequences in DNA, such as transcription factor binding sites, genes for the transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNAs that function in protein synthesis, and genes for other kinds of functional and regulatory RNAs. Now, this isn't an exhaustive sequence. There's lots of other sequences that don't code for protein but have important functions in DNA, but we don't have time to talk about all of them. Now, coming up next, we're going to talk about other causes of mutation. So far, we've just thought about mutations caused by errors by DNA polymerase. But there's a lot of other ways that DNA sequences can change. And we'll talk about those in Lecture 3, Lecture 2G. I hope to see you there.